Hello, I'm Dale Yurton, and welcome to our study, Our Riches in Christ. We're studying the book of Ephesians and looking at the church the way God sees the church. This is our second lesson in this series, and I'm calling this Seated with Christ. Seated with Christ. There's actually three different physical positions that the Apostle Paul uses to illustrate our relationship with Christ. And this is the first of those positions, seated with Christ. When Jesus was hanging upon the cross as he was being crucified, he cries out, it is finished. Now the question is, what was finished? What was he talking about? What was it that was finished? Well, the truth is, he was talking about our sin debt, that our sin debt was paid in full. No longer can the devil hold that over our heads because Jesus paid that price for us. And so this is the way that Paul begins the book of Ephesians as he speaks to us about our relationship with God. In Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 20 through 23. Paul says, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He's talking about what was accomplished at Calvary, what Jesus did when he died for us, that he literally took our place. He was the substitute sacrifice. He died so we could live. What an amazing story. No wonder they call it the good news, because it is good news. However, Jesus did not just die for us. Three days later, he arose from the dead. He arose out of the grave. And it's Christ's empty tomb that changed everything. When Jesus arose from the dead, suddenly we realized he has been accepted in heaven at the throne room of God. It was Jesus' resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven. That is our legal proof that his sacrificial death has been accepted. Thank God for that. We know of a surety that Jesus has paid the price for us because God accepted him into heaven, into his throne room. And so this is what Paul is describing in heaven's view of the church. See, it's the way that we understand the risen, ascended Savior that determines the way that we attempt to live the Christian life. Now, it's one of the sad things that I have seen over the years of ministry is that many people do not seem to understand Jesus paid it all. The sin debt was paid in full. So the devil can no longer hold the bad things we did in our past over our heads and threaten us with them. Jesus has settled that. He paid that debt. Now, Paul goes on to talk about our relationship with him in the second chapter of Ephesians, the fourth verse through verse six. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. For by grace, through faith, you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together 
in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, this is the way that we must view our position with God today. Because of what Jesus has done, he not only is seated in heavenly places, we must learn to see ourselves seated with Christ. Or as Paul said, he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the way that God views our redemption. He sees what he's ultimately going to accomplish in and through us. Many times we get caught in the struggle between now and eternity, but we must learn to live the Christian life from a seated position. Now, I understand that literally that has not been fulfilled and that Christ has not returned and we have not received our glorified bodies as yet. But as far as God is concerned, it is finished. He's already paid the debt. Now all we have to do is walk out the redemption that he has provided for us. So let me give you three different statements concerning this seated position and how it is to operate within our lives as believers. The first one is to be seated is a position of trust. Now, when I speak of trust, I'm talking about a higher level of faith. So many people think of trust as a passive word. No, not at all. It's a very active word. It's not as someone said, uh, tying a knot and just hanging on. It's more than that. Trust is a higher level of faith. For instance, let's go back to the seated position. When we are seated, when we sit in a chair, we place all our weight upon the chair. The same is true of our trusting in Jesus. We're not supporting the chair. No, the chair is supporting us. It, it is able to hold our whole weight. And we can relax in the chair knowing the chair is able to support me and I can sit here. That's the way we must begin our Christian life. If we do not understand that, then the devil has already tricked us and he's going to use that against us again and again, trying to get us to get into a fight with him and defeat him. When we must understand Jesus has already defeated him. So I must put my faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' victory becomes my victory. And I'm not trusting myself, I'm trusting him. There's a good story about a, a Bible translator in, in South America, in Ecuador. He was struggling to find a word for a, an indigenous language there for the word faith. He couldn't find any concept in their language that they use for faith until one day he heard two of these men of this particular tribe talking together and one of them spoke about tying your hammock securely. And the word literally meant where you can place your weight upon it. You can lie down in the hammock knowing it's going to support you because it is tied securely. When he heard that, he knew there's my word for faith. Now, this is exactly the same concept that the Apostle Paul is communicating when he uses the word faith. He doesn't mean that he can take care of part of our problems. No, he means Jesus is the answer to any problem that I will ever face in life. His grace is sufficient for me. So it's by grace through faith that we are saved. This is what Paul is talking about. We are seated with Christ. I want you to pause and think for a moment, sir. We cannot save ourselves. We've tried that. We can't do it. Only faith in Christ can save us. The writer of the book of Hebrews discusses this concept when he deals with our conscience. 
The word conscious means an inner knowing, knowing inside you. And he, he said that keeping the law of Moses, all the, you shall do this, you shall not do that, and keeping all the rules, he said it could never cleanse our conscience from our evil deeds. That only faith in Jesus Christ can do that because he's the only one that perfectly lived his life, then paid our debt for us. This is why we must understand we are seated with Christ. We can trust Jesus with everything in our lives. Now, now the good news is, is Jesus did not only come and die in our place and then was raised from the dead and ascended into the heavens to the throne of God, but it points us to the fact our need for a Savior doesn't end at Calvary. We not only needed someone that could pay our sin debt for us, we needed someone at the throne of God to be like our defense attorney, to be there to provide anything that is lacking within our life. And so this is why we see Jesus seated at the throne of God. He doesn't have to do anything else. He has done it for us. But in that seated position, he's still living as our Savior, our Redeemer. Again, the book of Hebrews, the seventh chapter, and verse 25, you read, Therefore he, Jesus, is able also to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So that's what Jesus is doing for us right now. Right now at this moment, he is praying for us. He is interceding for us so that no matter what the need is within our life, we have someone to defend us at the throne of God. I love to read from the Amplified Bible because it gives you the different shades of meaning for many of these words. For instance, this word uttermost, he is able to save to the uttermost. In the Amplified, it inserts and says, uttermost means forever, completely, for eternity. What, you, you, there, there's nothing that is not covered in that. If your faith, your trust is in Jesus Christ, then your faith and salvation is assured. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to fear. There's so many people that, that they're fearful they're going to do something that is going to make God angry with them and uh, they're going to lose their salvation. Salvation, it's not like losing your watch or losing your ring. No, no, no. Salvation is our relationship with God. And so we can put our faith completely, totally in Jesus Christ. We can trust him. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now here's the second thing I want to discuss with you about this position of being seated with Christ. To be seated is a position of rest. In other words, what I'm saying, we're emphasizing putting our faith in the finished work of Calvary. The devil is continually trying to deceive us and to get us trusting ourselves, trusting our own righteousness, trusting our own abilities, our own revelation, no, put your faith totally in Jesus, in trusting him. Now, this is one of the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it shows them six days they are working, and then they rest on the seventh day. The seventh day was the day of rest or the Sabbath day. They rested the seventh day because they have worked for the first six days. In the New Testament, Jesus fulfilled all the law of Moses. It was completely paid in full. He didn't do one thing to break the law. 
So in the New Testament, we have a new covenant, a better covenant. And we find that the New Testament reverses that order. Instead of working six days and resting the seventh, in the New Testament, we call the first day the Lord's day. We rest in him. We rest in Christ on the first day. And then the next six days, we work out the salvation that he has provided. In the Old Testament, they're working for salvation. In the New Testament, Jesus has finished. He paid the price totally for us. Now we're living out our Christian life. We're walking out what he has provided for us. So the way they lived in the Old Testament, they lived looking forward to the Messiah's coming. He's coming, and when he comes, then he's going to redeem us. We don't live that way. We live our lives looking both, looking back at his first coming. He came. He paid the sin debt. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the throne of God. But we know also he's going to return again. He's coming the second time. We're looking both backward to what he has paid for us, and we're looking to our ultimate redemption when he returns the second time. This is why the writer in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses one through three, speaks about the rest that we receive in Jesus. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear or use godly caution, lest any of you seem to come short of it, come short of the rest that he provides. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, referring to the Old Testament. But the word which they heard did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in those that heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, what he is saying there, he's comparing the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they were working, trying to keep the law. Do this, don't do that. And that's how they base their relationship with God. In the New Testament, we base it upon faith, the works that Jesus has already accomplished for us because of what he has done. He died in our place. God accepted that perfect sacrifice. He proved it by raising him from the dead and then ascended to the heavens where he said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the writer now is saying, we must enter into the rest that we see in Christ. And he said the reason they could not enter it was because they did not mix it with faith. That's what you and I have offered to us. Through grace, by grace, through faith, we are saved. And so because we mix the promise of God with faith, faith in what Jesus has done, he gives us this rest. Now, let, let me point out something this verse says, we must labor to enter his rest. What does that mean? That seems contradictory that we're working to enter his rest. It's simply saying we enter into what he has already provided for us as believers. That doesn't mean that we work for our salvation. No, we work because we are saved. We will not be saved by our works, but we will be rewarded for our works. And so now we're laboring, we're walking out what he has provided with his redemption. So he calls it laboring to enter into his rest. This is one of the things that I have discovered that's been a, a great blessing in my own personal life is we can measure our trust by measuring our 
rest. I, I, I remember many, many years ago when I was just a young Christian and I was still in my teenage years and something had happened in my life that had just broken my heart and I'm praying and, and trying to find answers from God and, and I remember I was at the altar and I'm just crying and praying and this dear sister walks by and she taps me on the shoulder and I look up through tear-stained eyes and she said to me, Sonny, he's not down there, he's up there. Oh, that was such a revelation to me. It was exactly the words I needed to hear and I still remember them to this day. That's what I'm saying to you. Of course there are things that we must do, but we are working from his position. He has provided my salvation. And so now I'm working out what he has given me. I'm living this life that he has provided for me. You can't work to earn it, but you must work because he has been so good to us. How could we not serve him? Now, the third thing I want to talk about in being seated is to be seated is a position of accomplishment. Now, when I talk about accomplishment, I'm not talking about what we have accomplished. I'm talking about what Christ has accomplished for us. Not ours, but Jesus has paid it in full. It is finished. Paul references this in Ephesians, the first chapter. Let me read from verse 3 through verse 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Oh, those are powerful words that Paul is giving us. He is saying that this plan of God is something that God has provided for us before he even created planet earth. He already had his master plan. And that's what it means when he said he predestined us. He planned this ahead, what he is working within our life. This amazing proclamation of our salvation. Now what this is simply saying is that from God's perspective, he has done everything he needs to do for our salvation. That's what the scripture that I just shared with you in Hebrews was referencing where it said it was a finished from the foundation of the world. It was finished from the beginning because he planned his work, now he's working his plan. So he's going to finish everything and that's the way he sees it. He calls it done. In Psalm 110 and verse 1, this verse is quoted several times in the New Testament, where he said, the Lord said to my Lord, that's God the Father speaking to God the Son, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now that's a position of rest, and that's a position of accomplishment. It is done. Now, I understand that Jesus is doing something right now, but he is not. He is not paying the redemption for our sins. He did that at Calvary. He's already finished that. It's paid in full. It's completely done. What he's doing for us right now is the scripture I gave you from Hebrews. He makes constant intercession for us. And it's one of the great assurances that we have, we're going to make it. We're going to be all right, no matter what the devil does. How do we know? Because Jesus is praying for us. 
and he gets his prayers answered. His prayers come to pass. So he's making intercession for us. Our position, Christ's position is to pray for us. Our responsibility is to trust him and to obey him. That's our responsibility as Christians, to walk out the salvation he has provided, he has given to us. That's what he has done for us. And because of what he has done for us, this brings us to the assurance of our salvation. Salvation is not something that I worry about that I'm afraid I'm going to lose because my salvation is not in myself. Jesus is my savior. He is my redeemer. My confidence is totally in him. And all I have to do is trust him. And of course, if I trust him, I will obey him. I will do whatever he tells me to do. And because of that, I have this utmost peace, this, this great delight that I, has been provided for me in Jesus Christ. This is what he meant when he says in Ephesians 2 and 6, he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so what I, I, I would say to you, this, this, this whole lesson about being seated with Christ is welcome to the throne room. Come sit with me in my throne. You must see that as something that Christ has provided no, not because we're great. It's because he is great. It's not because we've done wonderful things. No, no, no. Any wonderful thing that we did is what he did through us. It's simply because we believe when he cried, it is finished, that it is finished. And so I welcome you to Christ's throne room.